Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to the uh, MSR Colloquium. Today we have um, Dana Randall speaking to us. She's from Georgia Tech. We're very happy to have her visiting. She's actually visiting for the this entire week, so she'll be here tomorrow and Friday as well if you'd like to talk further about the um, topics that she's going to introduce us to. And uh, she tried to gear this talk especially for the social media people, so Nancy, you should be very, very happy with this talk. Very, um, <laughs> so let me uh, turn it over to Dana. Thank you, Nicole. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a great place to visit, and um, I've had interesting conversations already with people from all backgrounds, so I can't say that I've geared this towards social media, but I am aware. <laughs> so that's the most I could promise. Um, so I, I chose this talk because I actually think that um, what I'm trying to do is show that various topics in different fields that might on the surface seem quite different really are often the same problem disguised. And so while I think that hopefully something will be familiar to most people here, um, there probably will be a few topics that no one, everyone should have some topic that is bizarre. <laughs> it's sort of the hope. Okay, so um, my outline, I'm just going to tell you what I'm going to do. My, my real field of research is thinking about sampling. So I'm going to start and give you some background of how people in theoretical computer science think about sampling. I'm going to give a very specific example, which is independent sets on the grid. And then I'm going to talk about these crazy related phenomena from other fields that I don't know much about. But um, we're going to talk from physics, chemistry, and from economics. I'm going to give examples. And I'm calling them, I originally called it applications. I'm calling it related phenomena to say there really is something going on that's very similar in all of these models. OK, so the basics of sampling. Have I now, if you have a cartoon on the first slide, you know it's going to be a, <laughs> an elementary talk right now. OK, so by sampling, I really mean that I have some large set, which is typically exponential in, of size in some underlying parameter. And I want to pull one out at random. So maybe with the same probability, maybe with different probabilities. And an example might be an independent set. So if I give you a graph, the black vertices are an independent set because no two of them are connected by an edge. OK, so the black vertices are an independent set. And typically, there's an exponential number on a graph, and I want to sample one at random or according to a different weighted distribution that I'll explain later. Another example, which is of a very different flavor, is estimating the volume of a convex body. So imagine I have some convex body in n dimensions, and I want to know its volume. I might want to sample vertices that are inside this body, and then that will give me some, you know, and take the ratio to some larger one. You know, you could imagine that this is a way to estimate volume. And the reason is that there's related problems of sampling and approximate counting. So estimating a volume is like approximate counting. OK, so these are my goals. And I'm, I've been very interested in lattice models. So the same problems, but put on an underlying lattice. So this is the independent set model. You could imagine sampling matchings on the grid, which this problem, if you fatten the edges out so they become these rectangles is known as domino tiling, so domino coverings of the chessboard. Um, this is a coloring model, which in physics is related to something called the POTS model, a model of antiferromagnetism. The icing model, I'm actually going to say things about in this talk, so let me just say a word about how the icing model is defined. So um, each square, or vertex in the dual, I'm assigning plus or minus. And I'm going to give a reward every time I have two pluses that are next to each other. So the weight of this configuration, and I'll show this later on, is going to be some parameter lambda. And think of lambda as being greater than or equal to 1. And I'm going to take lambda, and I'm going to raise it to the number of nearest neighbor pairs that have the same spin. Okay? So when lambda is small, I don't really care so much about what's around me. But when lambda is large, I really care that a lot of edges want to have the same spin as their neighbors. So it's sort of the peer pressure, 
parameter. All right. Um, so I'm still up here. I'm going to be talking about independent sets. But to give you some idea of why people are interested in sampling in the first case, I'm going to show you some of the examples that I will end the talk with in greater detail. I'm just going to jump to them right away and just show you why sampling might give you insight into various problems. So I'm going to reveal what the whole second half of the talk will be in one slide each. So in physics, people are interested in understanding phase transitions, which is a macroscopic change to a system when you have a microscopic change in some parameter. So as I raise the temperature, ice turning to water or something becoming magnetized is an example. And here are simulations that are, these are samples of the icing model that I just explained at various values of this parameter lambda. So when lambda is small, things are very well mixed. You just see, you know, when it's one, you just are independently choosing colors. When it's small, you have something that looks like this. When lambda is large, which corresponds to low temperature, and I'll say later why that is, um, you're going to get most of this being black or most of this being white. So the peer pressure takes over and everybody, it's junior high school, everyone ends up wearing the same outfit. <laughs> okay. And then there's some critical point where you're somewhere in between. Media <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay. Um, here's a second example. This one is from chemistry. So colloids are, um, colloids are milk or glue. They're things that we actually experience. They're mixtures, mixtures of two different types of molecules. One molecule is suspended in the other. And the only constraint that these molecules have is that they have to be non-overlapping. OK? So, this is an example. I don't know if you could see it from there. I have large blue squares and tiny black squares. Okay? And imagine that both the black squares and the blue squares occupy the same density. So the density of each of these is the parameter I'm going to change. So this is a low density picture. And the, this is chosen uniformly, supposedly, from all the ways of having large and small squares, this number of them, in non-overlapping position. And this is high density. Okay? So again, this is chosen uniformly from all arrangements where they're non-overlapping, but it looks like something peculiar is going on that the big things seem to cluster together. Okay? So above some density, we seem to see a very different kind of behavior. And this is a, a characteristic of colloids that, um, that occurs, that people study experimentally. What's interesting here, <laughs> This is just higher density. I've just raised the number. Yeah. But the so blue, the small and the big are the two different molecules? That's right. So I have maybe the small ones are in a suspension of the big ones. And as I raise the density, what I was going to just say is that this is purely entropic. What I mean by that is it looks, when people see this picture, they assume that blue is attracting blue or blue is repelling black. That's not what's going on. This is just a picture chosen from all the ways that you could put things down so that they don't overlap. And somehow the big things cluster together. So is this why when you boil milk it curdles? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> when you boil what? Milk it curdles. No. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So again, yeah, yeah, yeah. The colloid. No, the colloid. This mixture of equal density. So I look at what happens at various densities and I start raising the density and a property, a characteristic of colloids is that at low density they're well mixed and at high density they separate. Sure. Okay? Yeah. Sorry, I have another question. Sorry, maybe I'm reading too I much. I love questions, so go. Yeah. I'm reading too much into the actual uh, diagram, but um, like in both of them it looks like the, the gaps in the, in the like small um, uh, particles are like kind of axis aligned. Right? Like you have this sort of horizontal little like yeah. yeah, they're not. This is in real space and they shouldn't be aligned. It shouldn't be happening. So I don't know if you're seeing it. We will get to it at the end. So this is supposedly a simulation. For those of you who kind of know everything that's going to be in my talk, of course, 
simulating this is hard because we don't really know how. So people are using things that. Okay, but, but, but I'm correct in assuming that, like, given where the big blue things are, the other things should kind of just be uniform. Yes, distributed. they are. Okay. Yeah, it, that is true. If you fix a backbone of where the blue things are, then just sprinkle this, the black things down, and that should be equally likely, right? Okay. So again, this is the second half of the talk. This is the teaser to tell you what I'm going to be talking about later on. And the third one, which I'm putting it at the beginning, so hopefully these models, you'll see similarity already. Um, this is Schelling's um, segregation model. Um, we should turn up the heat. Oh, I'm fine. But I'm moving. You're not. <laughs> but thank you. OK. So. Schelling said, let's try to come up with a model that we can use to study segregation back when people thought that segregation is formed by urban planning and urban design. And he was showing how it could just happen um, spontaneously in some sense. So um, imagine that you have houses in a city that are colored red and blue, to be politically correct. <laughs> um, and imagine that people move if within some radius they see too many houses of the opposite color. That makes them uncomfortable, and we find, maybe we find an unhappy red guy and an unhappy blue guy, and we have them switch. Okay? And here's an example of a simulation that I just stole off the web, hopefully not from somebody's paper who's in the audience, of <laughs> what might happen after some time. And not surprisingly, you're going to see the red houses clustering together and the blue houses clustering together. But the details of exactly how that happens and why it happens aren't completely understood. OK, so this is supposed to be motivation for, oh, wow, if we could sample, we can see these types of phenomena. And in reality, the methods that we understand in order to do the sampling actually have a lot in common with these three models as well. Okay, So I was talking to colleagues of mine, to colloids, <laughs> I was talking to <laughs> colleagues of mine, and, you know, one of my, um, Social media, that's the only, he is in social media. Um, one of my colleagues said, well, that's really easy. If you want to simulate these colloids, just take some uh, configuration at whatever density and add more things, just push them into the picture and see where things end up moving. Like add more squares by just pushing other things out of the way. Um, so this was his suggestion. He said, surely this will be fast and you'll get good samples. And I mean, the problem is that you're going to get the wrong distribution, OK? So anything that you try is, um, that's of this type is really going to give misleading information. And then another one for people in this area, the thing that they would think of is pick something up and choose a place uniformly and try to put it down. And that will give the right distribution, but it's going to take exponential time before you find an empty space to actually move it. So how you do this in a way that preserves the distribution um, so I just want to emphasize that the, our goal is to have something which is fast and which is correct, which gives the right distribution. And so in this area, and again, I want to emphasize this because I'm really looking at how these techniques are used in multiple application domains. One of the questions is, is the problem efficiently computable? Meaning, can we have any method for sampling in polynomial time? So give me any fast solution. Okay. Because in a lot of the applications, the dynamics are actually the thing of interest itself, sometimes coming up with some arbitrary algorithm is not so interesting. So I also want to know, does the natural method work? And both of these are interesting, depending on the application. OK, so one of the methods that we use to sample that is often what the natural chain is, the natural dynamics are doing is a Markov chain, which you could think of, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's just shuffling a deck of cards. So you start off, if you want to sample a random permutation, you have some shuffle you're going to do. And from whatever starting configuration, you get to a couple of possible other configurations, and you keep doing it. And you're hoping that if you do this forever, you'll have a perfectly uniform sample. And you're hoping if you do it long enough, you'll get a pretty good sample. Okay. So the three steps to designing a useful Markov chain is to come up with some shuffle that connects the state space that I could get from any permutation to any other permutation or any independent set to any other one. You want to then define the probabilities of choosing each of these transitions. 
in such a way that you converge to whatever distribution you're interested in, which might be uniform and it might not. And the last step is then to show that you're rapidly mixing, which means that if you do these steps in polynomial time, hopefully, you will actually be close to the stationary distribution. And typically, these two are very easy to do, and this is very challenging. So often we have chains that are provably not fast, and even when we have ones that are, it's not always easy to prove that it is. Okay. So um, the next section is going to be the only mathy part, really. <laughs> um, so I want to sample independent sets, only I don't want to sample them uniformly. So I'm given a parameter lambda, which is going to control the density of the independent set. Set here is just any set of vertices that are not neighbors. That's right. Okay, so I defined it in a general graph. Only now I'm going to be looking at independent sets on some this the chessboard. On an n by n chessboard. Okay, so I'm going to um, let's see. Given lambda, the probability of an independent set is going to be lambda to the size of the independent set. That's the number of vertices in the independent set. And then I'm going to normalize this by z, which is the sum of that weight over all configurations, so that this becomes a probability distribution that sums to 1. So I'm just normalizing it. So these are the relative weights. So um, just to get a feel for this, when lambda is equal to 1, this is the uniform distribution over all independent sets. Okay? And when lambda is much larger than 1, I'm favoring large independent sets in my stationary distribution. And when lambda is less than 1, I'm favoring sparse independent sets. Okay. And this is the simple algorithm that will work in the limit, if I were to walk forever, to sample according to this distribution. Okay. So I start at any initial independent set, say the empty one, because I could find that one easily. And then I'm going to repeatedly um, choose a vertex in the graph and a bit 0 or 1. If the bit is 0, I'm going to try to remove that vertex from the independent set. So if that vertex is in my current independent set, I remove it. But I only remove it with this funny probability, which I'll say something about in a second. And if, I, if b is equal to 1, I'm going to try to augment the independent set by adding this new vertex. And I add the new vertex to the independent set with this probability only if it's not in the independent set and none of its neighbors are in the independent set. So I have to stay within the set of independent sets. Okay? So the graph is connecting any two independent sets that differ by the addition or deletion of a single vertex. This connects the state space because starting at any independent set, I could just one by one remove everything and get to the empty independent set. So this connects everybody. The second step was to add these weights. These probabilities right here on the transitions, this is known as the metropolis algorithm, and it just forces the, cha the uh, chain to converge to exactly this distribution that we wanted. Okay, so I'm not going to say more about it. And so that means that the chain connects the state space, converges to the distribution we want, and we want to know how long it takes. Okay, so my goal is to understand this, and it's known as Glauber dynamics because we're just changing things locally. It's a variant of Glauber dynamics. Okay, so when I say how long, I took out all the technical stuff. The, the, the definition is just, if I look at the teeth step transition, or the, the distribution after t steps of performing the Markov chain, and I look at my goal distribution pi, I'm looking at how far those two distributions are point-wise, okay? And um, I want this to be less than epsilon or less than a quarter for some input epsilon. And I'm going to say it's rapidly mixing if this convergence, if I get R less than epsilon from the stationary distribution in polynomial time, and I'm going to say it's slowly mixing if it if requires exponential time before I'm close. It's some parameter, so it might be exponential in root n. It's exponential in some polynomial in n. Yeah, I'm purposely being a little vague. And we have all sorts of techniques that we can use to upper and, in fact, lower bound the mixing time of a Markov chain. And 
the, the one that you would learn in a probability class is the spectral gap. So if you take the adjacency matrix and you look at all of the eigenvalues, it's the, the largest eigenvalue will be one and the difference between the top two eigenvalues is going to control the rate of convergence. But we have an exponentially large state space that we can't even write down, so we can't explicitly calculate these. So everything else here is an attempt to estimate that spectral gap. And so we have various techniques, and a lot of these come from physics, and I'm pointing this out because I really want to sort of indicate the um, success of the communication between all of these fields. So going back here, I can try to apply all these different techniques and see if I could analyze this particular chain to get a bound. And the first one you might try is coupling. It turns out it's one of the simplest to do. And it gives you fast mixing when lambda is less than a half. Okay, so that's not very exciting, but of course people said, okay, that's the first thing you would try. What else can we do? And there have been many other improvements, and this is some partial history of what we know now. Um, so Luby and Vigoda pushed it up to lambda less than or equal to one. Whites had a beautiful improvement that got it higher, and Recently, Restrepo, and um, this is in the last year, um, they got it up to 2.38, okay? So whenever lambda is on the small side, this is favoring sparser independent sets, um, then we know that this Glauber dynamics mixes in polynomial time, so we could use it to sample, okay? However, there have been complementary results, okay? Here are the complementary results. So B and C might be people you know in this audience. <laughs> okay, so um, Christian and company showed um, that when lambda is large, this exact chain is going to take exponential time to converge. Okay, and there have been improvements. Um, we recently got it down to 5.396 or something. Okay, so you can see that there's a gap now where we know less than this, the chain is slow. Greater than that, the chain is Oh, sorry, less than this, the chain is fast. Greater than this, the chain is slow. There's a very strong conjecture that says that there's actually a critical point below which it's fast, above which it's slow, and that critical point is 3.79. That's numerics? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, we're in the ballpark now, but there's still a long way to go. Yeah. It's for the specific chain, but they generalize to quasi-local, as long as you're changing um, little o of n sites. So what is this 3.79? So 3.79 is a conjecture. We don't know that there's a critical point, but it's a conjectured value of the critical point. It's believed that below 3 point, when lambda is less than 3.79, these dynamics should be fast, and above, it should be slow. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, this has existed for a long time, and it's, um, yeah, th there's no hard evidence. I mean, we don't even know that there's a single critical point, although it seems, it doesn't seem unlikely. Yeah. Are there any proposed non-local chains? For independent sets, no, not really. I mean, it's, yeah. it's hard to imagine, you know, how you would, how you would get one, right? Mm-hmm. How you get a non-local non one, right? And somehow, if you try to change too much, then you know you're. Yeah, I mean, it's something that I'm thinking. A, this three point seven nine is not a result of some symmetry or conformal no. invariance or something. No, this is it's just, numerical. There's a strong uh, feeling that there is a phase transition here, and then that's an estimate of the value of the phase transition mm -hmm. based on the Monte Carlo. Based on Monte Carlo or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I mean, okay, so this is the state of the art right now, and um, before I move on to the second half of the talk, I sort of just want to indicate for those of you who aren't familiar with this, um, that, you know, this type of phenomenon, the reason we think this is going on is we're seeing it for a lot of different models. So, oh, I do actually say something about why this is happening. Um, so, okay, so why would we expect that these should be slow. All right, so here are three, remember, let me just go back for a second. Uh, when you have this weighting, 
we're talking about the case when lambda is large. When lambda is large, we're really putting most of the weight on very dense independent sets. So here are three fairly dense independent sets. These are the two maximally dense independent sets. We have the even vertices in the grid, and then we have the odd vertices in the grid. So I'm just coloring them red or blue depending on the parity of the sum of their coordinates. Okay? And here we have one in the middle, which happens to be half black and half red, if I, connect, if I counted correctly. <laughs> All right? And this actually has, if this is an n by n region, this has linearly fewer vertices than these two other configurations. Okay? And so the weight of this one, before we normalize, is lambda to the n squared over 2, as is this one. But the one in the middle has n over 2 fewer vertices. So it has lambda to the n over 2 less weight than the other two configurations. And I'm drawing it this way to say that if we were to plot the likelihood of seeing a certain ratio of even to odd or red to black or whatever, um, we would expect this kind of bimodal distribution because things here are going to have exponentially less weight than things on the other two sides. Okay, now of course, I'm cheating. And I'm cheating because the height of this is actually the sum over all configurations that have that balance. Okay, so all I showed you is that any particular configuration here has to have exponentially smaller weight than the other two sides but there's an exponential number of balanced configurations. So we have to be really careful to see the trade-offs between the lower energy, the lower weight, and the high entropy, which is the number of configurations there. And that's what all of those proofs of slow mixing were doing, was looking at that. Because if you could show that this picture is really what's going on, then when lambda's large, we say there's a bad cut in the state space. So if you're on this side, it will take exponential time before you could cross over to the other side because to go from a mostly black to a mostly red configuration, you have to pass through a balanced one if you're changing one vertex at a time. Okay, so that's the high level picture. Okay, so the summary that we know right now for independent sets on the grid is that there's a conjectured phase transition at some value, maybe 3.79. And we know rigorously fast and slow in these regions. For the icing model, yeah, well, one more question that's about fine. Um, so if you have the same chain, but say with some small probability, you flip the set, right? So, so that then you know, that just goes from the odd thing to the even thing, and you've folded that picture on itself, then now it, like, it looks single humped. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that would, that, the flipping would be a non-local. Yeah, and presumably that turns it into a fast chain, but we can't prove it. And for a lot of graphs, if you have, you can't always, you don't always have that built-in flip. So if you're really interested in the n by n grid, yes, you could presumably try something like that, but we don't have proofs that it's fast. But it should be. It should be. So, so somehow intuitively, like the picture you do really is the canonical, this is, the, this is kind of the only bottleneck in some sense, or? Uh, um, I mean... I'll explain to you afterwards why I wouldn't exactly say it that way. Okay. Um, so I said that um, this kind of phenomenon is actually coming up for many models. Um, for the icing model on Z2, particularly on Z2, really everything is known. And so we actually have a very clear understanding. But keep in mind, this is really the only model for which we know as much as I'm about to say, which is... We know there is a critical point. It's known what it is. We know that it's fast less than the critical point. It's slow greater than the critical point. And within the last couple of years, it was shown that it's fast at the critical point. So we have a complete picture for this particular model that what was suggested for independent sets is exactly the right picture. Um, there's a similar phenomenon happening with coloring. So three colorings. Um, on grid regions, there's no parameter, right? Okay, so I'm just looking at uniform probability on all three colorings. And here you see the phase transition if you change the dimension, okay? So in two dimensions, 
if you take the algorithm that you choose a vertex and a new color and try to recolor with that new color, we know it's fast in two dimensions, but we know that in sufficiently high dimensions, exactly that algorithm ends up being slow. Okay, so changing the dimension is sort of a way of simulating adding this parameter. All right, so this, this seems to be happening in many, many other models too. Okay, so I am, um, and exactly what you're asking, I mean, that's sometimes not in this particular case, but in some of these cases, by understanding why the chain is slow because of these phase transitions, it does suggest other algorithms. So that actually is the question that I ask at the end of the talk also that is my main interest in all of this. Okay, so um, I'm gonna switch now and just say a word about, um, more than a word, but I'm gonna talk about how these same models are coming up by scientists looking at very different types of questions, okay? So um, the physics one, I have to confess, I almost took out of the talk, but I'm gonna <laughs> put it really quickly to just say that, you know, as somebody interested in sampling, I, you know, these models, matchings and independent sets and so forth come up quite a lot. Um, the reason they come up in physics is slightly different, but people are asking almost the same questions. So, um, Okay, so to remind you, this was the icing model. So a physicist would be interested in a physical system and they would define a Gibbs measure as follows. So they have some function of the system, which is the Hamiltonian, and I'll give you examples in a second. Um, one over KT is inverse temperature. And they define the probability of a configuration to be e to the minus beta, inverse temperature, times the Hamiltonian. And then they normalize by dividing by z, which is known as the partition function, which again is just the sum over all configurations, okay? And I include this in talks on comp to computer scientists because for some reason, as soon as I write it this way, everyone seems much more confused. So I'm yeah, hopefully... Like what, what? <laughs> <laughs> so let me go two more seconds. Okay, so this is for Yael. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> okay. All the symbols. So beta is inverse temperature. H is a Hamiltonian which depends on the problem we're looking at and Z is normalizing. Okay, so, it, it, hold on. K is a constant oh. that has to do with the physical universe. Yeah. Okay, so Boltzmann's just, constant. We get it. Okay. 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 K is one. In, is in your we, units, K is one. K is because we don't measure temperature in Celsius, but some weird. I see. Okay. So don't I, worry about okay. it. It's, uh, in the right units, it's gone. Okay. I guess I had that in a previous version. Okay, so for independent sets, H of sigma is minus the size of the independent set. And for the icing model, H of sigma is minus the sum over nearest neighbors of the product of the spins. This still, for computer scientists, is very confusing. So we do a change of variables, and if I define lambda to be e to the beta, now I can say for independent sets, the probability of sigma is lambda to the size of the independent set normalized, and that's just what I showed you on the previous slide. And this, for some reason, computer scientists understand, <laughs> okay, myself included, okay? And again, for the icing model, we do the silly change of variables, and now it's just what I said before. The weight of a configuration is some other parameter new raised to okay, my colors got messed up, but e to the equals is just the number of nearest neighbor pairs that have the same spin, okay, and we normalize, and that's it. That's what all of this says. And okay, so what I've just done is I've defined... Comfortable, actually. <laughs> I mean, it is just different cultures. Right, I know, it's funny. So, um, okay, so this is on a finite graph, but um, physicists are interested in what happens in the limit on infinite graphs. Okay, so we can't define these probabilities this way on an infinite graph. So they define it as a limit. So they say, we're interested in defining a probability and we're going to look at what happens in larger and larger regions as we approach infinity and trying to look within a region whether it stabilizes, okay? And unfortunately what happens is the boundary matters now, okay? So think about fixing, I don't know why these turn to white, but you know, I fix either odd vertices around the boundary of an independent set or the even vertices, say, around the boundary, okay? Um, and then what happens is that at low temperature, you get these long range effects, which is at low temperature, whatever color you had around the boundary here, 
you're more likely to see on the inside. In other words, if you had odd vertices around the boundary, then on the inside, you're likely to see more odd vertices. At high temperature, that dies out. So at high temperature, whether you had odd or even, what you see in the middle region is the same. Okay, so I would say here, no matter how I go to infinity, there's a unique limiting distribution, whereas up here, there's certainly not a, limiting, a unique limiting distribution because we found two boundary conditions that give two different limiting distributions in the middle, okay? So just really gimmicky, cartoony. What's happening up here is this was exactly where I showed you for large lambda, we had this bimodal distribution, okay? And so what's happening on the boundary is controlling which side that you're in. Whereas down here, this was the case where at, the, um, at high temperature, it corresponds to low lambda where the independent sets are sparse. We have this unimodal distribution and as you change it, there's some critical point. And the point of all of this is that if you're looking at the question that physicists would ask is when is there a unique limiting distribution um, for the hardcore model that's independent sets, that's the physics name for independent sets, the best rigorous results now are exactly the results I showed you on the previous, one of the previous slides for the mixing, for fast and slow mixing, okay, of the Glauber dynamics for independent sets. And I want to make it clear that these don't come automatically. You actually have to do a slightly different proof each time. We don't have something that automatically says that one implies the other, but these results follow. Okay, so even looking at the question as a physicist, the techniques that are being developed are saying something over in this domain as well on the infinite lattice, even though we're studying them on the finite lattices. How were the questions different? What was the previous question? I mean, the answer okay, the same. <laughs> right. In the previous question, if I add or remove a single vertex at a time, right, with the appropriate metropolis probabilities, do I converge quickly to stationarity? And here it's, um, if I look at the limiting distribution on the infinite, not a finite, but the infinite lattice, do I have a unique limiting distribution or not? And the conjectured 3.79 that we're talking about is conjectured for, the, for this question, not for the mixing rate question. But people believe it's the same. No. Yeah. It's, it, sh it should be. I mean, perhaps with some appropriate now it was conditions. An embarrassment of your field before it was an embarrassment of mine. <laughs> <laughs> really? We're in the same field, Jennifer. <laughs> okay. So this was just sort of to give you some background um, on physics. So clearly, I've indicated, I hope, that the mixing question and this limiting distribution question that physicists would ask are the same question in, in, in some sense. Okay, so I'm gonna switch now to, chemist, to this chemistry model and then at the very end I'll say something about the shelling model. Okay, um, so we have mixtures of two different types of molecules and they can't overlap. Um, so for starters, all the kinds of algorithms that we know of for simulating things here should be slow, okay? So people have come up with really clever, non-rigorous algorithms for doing these types of simulations. These come out of papers of people using various heuristics that might be fast. Um, we have some evidence that they might not be. So I, I don't know if this is really a random configuration, but this is what people believe that they look like. Kind of, yeah. No, it, there, there's actually an amazing algorithm that's used. And it's very clever. It's, um, it's Buhat and Krauth. And what they did is, um, I guess I'll tell you after. But I mean, it, it's non-local. <laughs> it's clever and I, I'll explain it afterwards, but. I'm not going to get through anything if I do it now. But that's an open question. How do you simulate these things? All right. So these pictures are supposed, yeah? So how do you define the uniform distribution here? You take the, just a uniform distribution over independent placements of each molecule Correct. and then condition on them being not overlapping? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's equivalent. 
And I mean, this is, um, people study it in real and discrete spaces. I'm now going to, con to switch over to discrete models of colloids rather than real models. So here they're in real space, okay? So I'm going to introduce a family of discrete models that I can say something about. Okay, so for my discrete models, I'm going to have two types of tiles. Tile one sits, has some rules of where they can sit. Tile two sits, has some rule as to where they can sit, and they have to be non-overlapping. Okay, so here, model one is my A tiles are squares that sit on lattice faces, and my B tiles are diamonds that are bisected by lattice edges, either horizontally or vertically, okay? Here's another discrete model in the same family. A tiles are squares on the faces, and B tiles are squares centered at vertices. So here, the A tiles and the B tiles are the same size. For most of the models, they have different sizes. All right? And I'm going to just tell you one of the technical things that makes the analysis a little bit nicer is that I had said that we're gonna look at fixing the density of both of them to be the same. There's no reason they need to be the same. So I really have two different parameters controlling the density of each. And I'm going to fix the density of one of them. And I'm going to let the other one, I'm going to choose all the places where I could put a B tile given a fixed A configuration. I'm gonna let it be there or not be there with probability lambda or one minus lambda. Okay, so, so I, I could control the expected number of B tiles and the number of A tiles, okay? Do these models look familiar? Okay. So this is the icing model, and this is the independent set on a lattice that's rotated by 45 degrees. So this one, I will show you a picture later on in the talk that will demonstrate it. These are exactly what we've been talking about. It's just disguised. Okay, and I should say, it's the icing model at fixed magnetization for the physicists. <laughs> All right, so previous work, this first model of squares and diamonds was introduced by Frankel and Lewis, and they saw that, this, that the behavior could be inferred from the fixed temperature icing model. So the fixed temperature icing model has been studied um, really extensively, and Jennifer has done very nice work on this as well, and there's, um, the exact limiting shape is known as the wolf shape, and there have been tons of papers analyzing exactly what the limiting shape is going to be, and it turns out that that is going to tell you something for the, um, this colloid model that I, model one, that I'm calling model one. What are you calling the exact limit? What's the limiting shape? So, if I, ins well, um, when you go to higher density, when you go to high enough density, it's saying that the blue squares are going to cluster together and they're going to behave like the plus spins of a dense, of an icing model at low temperature, okay? And how the plus spins are going to cluster is going to be, it's going to be square-like. Equation, which is like a minimization of the energy, which gives you the, the boundary of that shape plus fluctuations around that. So you the plus region. That's right. So you prove that with overwhelming likelihood, most of it goes into a single bubble, plus perturbations of that, and the shape of that bubble is something which minimizes a certain energy functional, uh, plus all these, uh, all, all the fluctuations of around that, and Wolf in about 1900 came up with an equation for that energy. Thanks, yeah. So again on the previous slide, so uh, could you please define the model on the left again? So what is the distribution? Okay, so I'm fixing the number of blue tiles to be a certain density, so there's at most n squared, I'm fixing b n squared blue tiles, okay? And then the um, red tiles, I'm looking at all configurations where they're there with probability lambda and not there with probability one minus lambda. And I'm choosing from all configurations where you could have that. So, so for instance, the distribution on just the blue tiles is the, is the uniform? No, it's, it's right. So, okay, so 
I'm giving the weight of a blue configuration is going to be um, the sum over all ways that you could have red tiles consistent with it of the weight of the red tiles, which is going to be lambda to the number that are there, one minus lambda to the ones that are not there. Okay, so exactly what's happening here is that if I push the red ones together and minimize the perimeter, I have more places for the blue tiles. And that's exactly what's controlling why you end up having these things pushed together. So things where they're pushed together and the perimeter is minimized, it turns out that those are gonna have the most weight if you sort of mod out by the blue ones. So it's not uniform over, I know I said it so that it sounded like it was, that wasn't what I meant. Okay, okay. So what we do is we define a class of interfering binary mixtures that includes model one and model two that lets us argue about there being clustering um, that will apply to this entire class and we give direct proofs that are reminiscent of what's going on here for the Ising model. So it's generalizing this, but of course we're not getting something nearly as precise as the wolf shape. So we're getting much weaker bounds on understanding the limiting distribution, but it will apply to this whole class. So here are examples of interfering binary mixtures. There's many others, but it includes model one and model, well, model two and model one. Here's another one. So the definition is going to be that I have two planar lattices, lambda sub a and lambda sub b, that tile the entire plane, okay? And I'm looking at the intersection of both of them with some finite region, say a rectangle. All right, and it's an interfering binary mixture if it has the following property, that if I take a cell of lattice A and a cell of lattice B, they're either disjoint, they intersect at just a vertex, or they overlap, and the overlapping area is iso are always isomorphic to some fixed shape S. Okay, so in this case, whenever I have a diamond intersecting a square, I always have this yellow triangle in one of the four orientations. Does that make sense? Okay. So I always have some fixed shape. We can extend this to a finite number of fixed shapes S. Okay, but for now I'm just gonna state it in terms of one. So this is an example of an interfering family. This is also an, a, a, an example. When the red and the blue squares overlap, this is the only way they can, and they intersect in a smaller square S like this. So this is in the class and that other model is. Here, I'm gonna now show you why this is independent sets. So take the squares and shrink them down and rotate your head by 45 degrees. <laughs> so the red vertices are the odd ones and the blue vertices are the even ones. And this is just an independent set on a rotated grid. Well, it's on a rotated diamond. <laughs> okay, so, so we're, we're seeing the same types of models the same combinatorial structure is really coming up in these very disparate things. So here are, I'm just gonna state the types of theorems that we have for this class of interfering binary mixtures. So again, we're fixing B n squared A tiles. So B is always gonna be less than or equal to a half. So the A tiles occupy at most half of the volume. And the B tiles are present with this probability. So we have two theorems, I'll put them up at once, which just says, for any fixed number of, of A tiles, there's some lambda above which we're going to get clustering, okay? And for any B, there's another lambda star below which we won't get clustering. Okay, so that's what the two theorems say. So it lets us understand the role of the A tiles and the B tiles independently rather than just saying as we change them both at once we get this phase transition, or we get clustering. Okay, so what is the clustering property? Okay, and this holds for all interfering binary mixtures the way I've defined it. So this is a picture of something we would say is clustering, and this is a picture of something that is not clustering. Okay, so what does it mean for it to cluster? So informally, there's a region, so this black outlined region, and notice in this case it's disconnected, that has small perimeter, linear perimeter, quadratic area, it has large area, small perimeter. The blue tiles are dense on the inside of the region and they're sparse on the outside. 
Okay, so that characterizes this. Here we have quadratic area of a quadratic perimeter. So I'm not calling that clustered. Okay, so this is the definition that we use to prove those two theorems. Okay, yeah. Sorry, so did, did you not, uh, do you know whether there may or may not be, so you could have a gap between clustering and non-clustering, yeah. the lambdas. It, do you necessarily have a gap, or you don't know if they're... If we are not proving anything close to the critical point. So, yes, we don't know that what, exactly what's happening in between. But we know that for any... I mean, this things weren't worded in this form before, that if you fix the number of A tiles and let the other one vary, I can find a point above which, and I could find a point below which for any fixed d density, yeah. So that's all I can prove. Yeah? Okay, just as far as, like stuff in like the real world so uh so you, you know if you have i like, don't know whatever your question is <laughs> you know so like things like protein folding right so it's hard for us to fold protein you know it's computationally and lo and behold you know in the real world it mm -hmm. takes a long time for your proteins to properly fold it takes on the order of you know, fractions of seconds but it's a long time right um and for these things like if i take like you know the water and the powdered milk and mm -hmm. i mix it and i shake it around then, like, do you get these, like, uh, the, the... So saying that these dynamics are slowly mixing, which is what I'm suggesting by connecting it to the other models, is different from saying we're going to see the clusters quickly. So we will see these clusters happen quickly. It's just to mix and get to other clustered configurations will take a long time. And I, when I say it will happen quickly, I can't prove that. But it will happen quickly. Yeah. There was another question? Okay. So who wants to hear about segregation? <laughs> okay. Um, I know a lot less about segregation. <laughs> I'm trying to learn more, but, um, but I think what's interesting, let me just start by saying that there's, um, part of what's interesting is that there are so many variants on the original shelling model, and I think that a lot of them are really worth studying. So. Here are some interesting variants. Okay, so the neighborhood size. Do I care about my four immediate neighbors? Do I care about my 12 immediate neighbors? Is it any radius R? Do I care about everyone in the city, but maybe I care less when they're farther away? Okay, so um, these are all variants that I think are worth studying and we can say things about. This one is interesting. So um, Schelling said the following. He said, within a, a radius R, suppose that we're completely indifferent up to 50% of the other color. But as soon as we hit 50%, we're as unhappy as if everyone were the other color. Okay, so it's just, there's two states. You're happy or you're unhappy, all right? And um, we could consider instead a geometric function where every time a new, <laughs> a new one of them move in, I get a little bit more unhappy, okay? So you can imagine something where you have a geometric um, function where you just become increasingly unhappy. And you know this geometric bias function is actually going to correspond to the icing model that we've been talking about, okay? On just a graph that depends on the radius. And you could consider all sorts of other things in between, all right? But he originally proposed the threshold version. You could consider an open or a closed neighborhood. So an open neighborhood means if I'm unhappy with the demographics around me, I'm going to move to a different city, okay? Um, versus a closed city where this number of red and blue people work in the city and they just have to move somewhere else, but their job is in the city and they can't move somewhere else is the closed setting. You could consider saturated versus non-saturated. Are there empty houses? And are empty houses next to you desirable or undesirable? And we've considered it in the setting where it's a foreclosure. It's not a good thing to be next to. So you hate being next to an empty house even more than next to the other color. Okay. This one is really, um, I'm sort of obsessed with right now, selfish versus global. When I decide to move, am I just looking at my local neighborhood and saying, I would be happier over there, so I'm going to move over there? Or is the fact that when I move over there, I might make a lot of other people a little bit more unhappy? Do I care about that? Okay, so, <laughs> so you know, 
I mean, for a lot of the models that we've been talking about, and I hope you can see now that there's similarity between the Schelling model and these statistical physics type models that we've been playing with, that it, it's a product measure over everyone's happiness. And you decide whether to move or not based on the change in happiness of everybody. But presumably, there's more, something more selfish going on when people are deciding where they're going to live. And I don't know how to handle the selfish case at all yet. So everything that I'm going to talk about is in the global setting. So for starters, if we have this geometric bias function, we have any radius, we have an open city. Was a global case, though, right? No, he was, he was selfish. Oh, he was selfish, OK. Yeah. Which, out of context, sounds very bad, but that's <laughs> OK. So the open setting, so I'm looking at the open setting where people can move to other cities. I'm going to start by talking about the saturated setting. So there are no empty houses. So in this case, as soon as someone red moves out, someone blue or red can move in. And if they happen to also be red, then it's as though there was no change. And if they're blue, it looks like they changed colors. OK, so just, just houses are desirable. OK, and so in this case, um, lambda is the unhappiness. So we are in the case where we have a geometric bias function. So for every neighbor that I have within my radius of the other color, I'm lambda unhappy. It's my bias factor. And I move with probability, which is proportional to lambda to the number of unlike neighbors over z. It's actually, I didn't say it the right way. It's the product over everybody of this. So, so you're, e you're equally unhappy with your next door neighbor being a different color and your like four houses away from you as long as everything is within the radius. Yes, but we could generalize to where you vary it. And in fact, we could generalize to any radius, um, even infinite, you know, as long as, uh, yeah, as long as it's decreasing influence farther away. So I can make it so that I care more about my immediate neighbors. Right now, I'm just defining it in the simpler case. Yeah. Um, okay. And then, you know, we get something, we get these two statements, which are really very similar to an icing model on. When r is equal to 4, this is just what we're getting for an icing model. And we're looking at it for larger radii as well, including the infinite radii case. Um, this is parameterized in a weird way. But it's basically saying that when, when my tolerance is high, so I'm not very racist, or everyone in the city is not very racist, the city stays integrated. And when I start becoming very biased, in this case and in the open setting, a ghetto will form and one color or the other will take over. Okay, so there will of course be variation, but the city will be predominantly one color or the other. And you know, we are showing that whether it converges quickly or slowly, but really there are additional proofs that can show using kind of the clustering definition that we had in the context of colloids that we're getting integrated or ghettos forming. So we're getting clustering or no clustering in the, by the definition that I just gave. And presumably, we could also show it for closed cities, but the proofs are getting really complicated, so we haven't shown that yet. Okay, um, And we can also do it in the non-saturated setting. So here you have, this is how much you hate people of the other color. You even greater hate empty houses next to you. Okay, So in terms of these two parameters, it's sort of a funny definition, but we have a similar, the, the Fast proofs are the same, and the slow proofs take into account the extra parameter. So very similar um, results as I just showed you. We can handle the empty houses. And then we can generalize from geometric to something we're calling by Lipschitz functions, which just means that I need that. You could have something like threshold behavior, but I need, in addition, that every time at 50%, I might get a lot more nervous living where I'm living. But with each new person of the other color who moves in, I have to get a little bit more unhappy. This is terrible. <laughs> but OK. So OK. So you know, a lot of these we can I haven't been able to say anything about threshold behavior, but Christian has ideas, which I'm excited about. Um, I don't know how to say anything about selfish behavior using these types of approaches. OK, so the conclusions, I mean, especially for those of you not in the field, um, what I'm trying to show is that really across very different fields, people, of course, are seeing phase transitions and are seeing similar types of behavior. But in some sense, they're really actually almost the exact same model if you specialize it the right way. So we really can learn a lot about the behavior of these models by 
bringing over some of the techniques that we've been used to study them. But the subtle differences really can be significant. So, you know, we, it looks like the same proof should work, but we have to really redefine the proofs in the context of the parameters we're being studied in terms of housing or in terms of they become slightly different questions. And they can be significant differences. So next steps, this is the question that he's been asking, is can we use the underlying physics to build smarter sampling algorithms when we know things are slow is um, something that I really care a lot about. For the shelling model, can we analyze segregation models in closed cities? Again, I think we can do that, but we haven't yet. So this is where you, people can't move out of the city. They just have to move somewhere else within the city. For the threshold bias function, so this is what, again, I think there might be new ideas for this, but I haven't been able to prove anything for. Or the really important question here, I think, is when the moves are selfishly motivated. If my desire to move somewhere or not is just, as, is it better for me? I don't care about whether you don't want me there. <laughs> yes? So is there anything known about the selfish model, like heuristically, or what did Schelling have to say about it? Um, you know, Schelling's original model, Schelling didn't say much about the way I'm presenting it here. For example, I have in my model that everybody has some probability of moving. In his, you only move if you're unhappy. So there has been some um, discussion among physicists looking at the Schelling model of whether the selfish behavior and the non-selfish behavior should, whether that's a significant change or whether that's not a big deal to change it and there isn't consensus. I haven't found a lot on it. So the Schelling model is actually a Seller automata to some extent. You have deterministic moves. I, yeah, it was, yeah. 71, yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, it was, um, you know, there's this holy grail to really understand the model that Schelling first put out, but in some sense, I think that we have better understanding about how to model exactly what he was modeling, was trying to get at, that might actually be simpler to analyze and might actually be more realistic. So, at this point. Okay, so thank you. <laughs>